Good afternoon, everyone. Good, it works. Good afternoon. Pleased to see so many of you here today. Uh, my name is Tabby Chavis, and I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Psychology, uh, but here in my role also as the director of the National Center for Institutional Diversity. Uh, Today, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Stephanie Kirschbaum, who is an associate professor in English at the University of Delaware and a um, National Center for Institutional Diversity scholar in residence for the 2019-20 academic year. Uh, we're honored to have Dr. Kirschbaum here to uh, join our Research and Scholarship Seminar Series, and to, uh, which is a seminar series that's intended to feature scholars whose uh, work illuminates historical and contemporary issues related to identity, difference, culture, representation, power, inequality, and oppression uh, as they affect individuals, groups, communities, institutions, and societies. Um, another aspect of this series is that we seek to also consider the ways that we might engage this type of scholarly knowledge to act on um, and positively enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education, as well as in, broad, in the broader society space. Uh, I'm pleased to co-sponsor this event uh, with the National Center for Institutional Diversity uh, with, in partnership with the Department of Psychology, who is a co-sponsor along with the Department of English um, for uh, Stephanie Kirschbaum's residency this year. So our Scholar in Residence program, to do a little plug for it, um, also provides a residency period for scholars for a one-year academic period uh, in collaboration with academic departments. Um, so think about uh, uh, use of this program and scholars that would be terrific contributors to that community, just as Dr. Kirschbaum has been this year. Uh, already this year, in addition to working on her own scholarly work, which was a big part of her goal for her residency, that she is engaged with different communities here on campus in the Department of English, with our advanced program, with the Department of Psychology, um, with the knowledge community focused on invisible disabilities, among, uh, among other spaces that have been trying to engage scholarly knowledge with action and practice around issues of disabilities in higher education communities. Um, uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring up my esteemed colleague, Allison Earle, who will do a formal uh, introduction of Dr. Kirschbaum uh, before uh, she begins her presentation. Thanks so much, Tab. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Earl. I'm on the faculty here in the psychology department and a member of the diversity committee here in the psychology department. And uh, along with the diversity committee, on behalf of the diversity committee, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Stephanie Kirschbaum today. Uh, she's an associate professor of English at the University of Delaware and a 2019 NCID scholar in residence. During her time at the University of Michigan, she would love to connect with faculty working in disability studies, narrative and story-based research, deaf studies or sign language studies, as well as those with work on projects related to faculty mentoring, supporting minority and underrepresented faculty, and issues around academic culture and institutional transformation. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2005, and her work broadly focuses on understanding how the ways people interact can help higher education institutions address issues of diversity and difference. Her first book, Toward a New Rhetoric of Difference, was awarded the 2015 Advancement of Knowledge Award from the Conference on College Composition and Communication. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephanie Kirschman. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, can folks hear me in the back? Are we good? Yes, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here today. I'm grateful, grateful to Jackie Matisse in the Department of Psychology, as well as Marie Ting, Ching Yun Sylvester, and Tabi Chavis from the National Center for Institutional Diversity for inviting me to speak today and for collaborating on this event. I want to particularly acknowledge Dana Brown at NCID, who has been instrumental in building support structures for institutional accommodation within NCID during my scholar and residence period. I also want to acknowledge that I am a guest on Stolen Land today. 
the University of Michigan School of Social Work has a land acknowledgement that notes that the University of Michigan, named for Michigami, the world's largest freshwater system and located in the Huron River, River watershed, was formed and had grown through connections with the land stewarded by Nisui Ishkodawan Anishinaabeg, the three Fais people who are Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandotte Nation. I am grateful to be a guest in these lands, and I commit to show solidarity for the continued fight for indigenous sovereignty. I have about 30 access copies of my scripted remarks, and some of you may have gotten some when you walked in, but if you would like to be able to read along or if reading would help you follow what I am saying, please just raise your hand and Dana has some extra copies and she can bring them to you. Um, for visual accessibility, I'll describe myself briefly. I am a white cisgender woman with short brown hair and my preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm wearing black pants and jacket and a blouse with a magenta flower print. I want you to please feel free to move around, uh, stand up, leave the room, come back in, uh, do all, knit, uh, whatever you need to do with your body to be fully present in this space. Um, when images appear on my slides, I will describe them um, as they appear on the screen. But I'll also invite you, if you notice details, to collectively help me describe them um, by sharing other things that you notice. Finally, I want to acknowledge that a great deal of labor has gone into making this space one in which we can gather today, including those who maintain and clean this building and its room. Uh, so the image on this slide is a brick wall and hallway leading to a circuitous ramp enabling people with wheels to move between Angel and Mason halls in the lower level. A large maroon sign with white lettering had the wheelchair icon on it, the words to Angel and Planetarium, and an arrow pointing to the left. So I was asked to deliver my remarks on this topic because of ongoing conversations happening on campus around faculty and accommodation, including increased attention within LSEA and within the Vice Provost for DEI's office and in other spheres. I've done research directly on faculty and accommodation, work that's been published in two articles focused on faculty with mental disability and the reference on this slide I've also generated data with 34 disabled faculty members with a wide range of different disability experiences at different institution types, working in different fields of study, and with a broad range of personal identifications that matter to their experience of disability. I'm guessing at least some of you may have come to this talk hoping for some practical suggestions and how-tos around faculty accommodation. And I'll be glad to field questions at the end in that vein, but this isn't a practical talk. I'm gonna use this time to tell some stories instead. Some of this talk is going to be comprised of stories from research interviews I did with disabled faculty. But I'm also gonna tell a bunch of my own stories, particularly because one of the things that I hope you will all take away from this talk is the opportunity to question and think about the means by which disability is available for your noticing here at the University of Michigan. I may be something of an outsider to U of M, a visitor for a year who is soaking up the opportunities, connections, and incredible community on this campus as I focus in on a book project from which some of this talk is generated. But I'm not an outsider to higher education. I've been living and working on college campuses for 25 years now, almost entirely at large public state institutions. At the Ohio State University, where I did my undergrad, where at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I completed two graduate degrees, and as a faculty member at the University of Delaware and at Texas A&M University. I've also traveled extensively, giving talks and workshops, for which I have made accommodation requests and often been connected to campus disability services offices at more than 25 other institutions. 
And I have to say that this campus has the most egregious situation for faculty and accommodation that I have personally experienced. And while much of this talk touches on my experience, I can guarantee you that what I'm talking about is affecting a lot of other people as well, at U of M and elsewhere. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let me tell you a little bit about how I got to this place. The image on this slide is a yellow diamond-shaped word sign that says deaf person in area. Um, so as I have lived a life as a deaf person, I have moved from ignoring disability as much as possible to framing disability as something that only mattered in special circumstances to recognizing disability as mattering everywhere and every when. Signs of disability are everywhere around us, even if we don't always know how to pay attention to them. Take deafness as an example. Even though deafness is sometimes referred to as an invisible disability, signs everywhere disclose it. Behind the ear hearing aids, hands flying in sign language, um, yellow diamond-shaped deaf person signs, uh, deaf architectural space, deaf space as an architectural concept. I'm talking now as a white, middle-aged, deaf, cisgender woman who has been immersed in disability studies for almost 15 years and who has built a range of relationships with deaf and disabled academics. And these experiences have taught me how to notice deafness in all kinds of ways. But while I was born deaf, I wasn't born noticing deafness. My attention to deafness has been shaped over time as I've moved through the world. So when I attended new student orientation before the start of my first year of college, I tried to convince the Office for Disability Services that I didn't need accommodation. I was gonna be just fine. And I, think I ultimately relented after some pressure from my mom and the, on the office and agreed, I'll, I'll just try it, right? And I was sure, and I'm, I'm going off script here, but I was sure that I was gonna be right. I was gonna show them that I didn't need this, right? And even after I grudgingly acknowledged how much of a difference it made to actually know what people were saying in class discussion, I still felt like my disability did not matter that much. And if it did matter, it only mattered in very specific circumstances. It was not until I finished graduate school and started an academic career that I really confronted the mattering of disability in my life at work. I was in my late 20s and writing my first book under the pressure of the tenure clock. Feeling intense anxiety about my professional future, I knew I needed to publish. In what I might characterize as desperation, I, at long last, followed some advice that I'd gotten from multiple colleagues. I wrote about my deafness in an article. I had resisted these suggestions for a long time because I wanted to believe that my disability had nothing to do with the work that I was doing. But once I did this work, nearly every reader commented by remarking how powerful my discussion of disability was and how helpful they found it to my theorizing. While heartened by this praise, I nevertheless felt extremely uneasy. I was so accustomed to not wanting my disability to matter, of not wanting it to be the center of attention and this praise made me worry about what it meant that it seemed to matter so much to everyone else. Now, of course, I knew my disability mattered. My undergraduate experience with accommodations led me to immediately request accommodations when I went to graduate school. And when I went on the job market for the first time, I requested interpreting for every single interview because I did not want to risk being in the awkward and possibly job offer threatening situation of having someone I could not understand ask me a question. And the tension that I felt around whether and how to disclose my deafness were inflected by the normativity of my other readily apparent identification as a partnered white cisgender woman. 
when I received a job offer, I made clear that I would need regular access to sign language interpreting. And over time, I integrated accommodations into more and more of my academic life. And yet, throughout all of this change, I did not want my deafness to matter. I was deeply invested in maintaining my sense that, at least in my writing, in my scholarship, in lots of areas of my life, it didn't matter that much. I was wrong. My tenure track years were dominated by conference experiences with uneven interpreting services that largely provided just a veneer of accessibility. One way I responded to this conference inaccessibility involved significant behind the scenes labor in which I created detailed schedules for every minute of every session that I wanted to go to, search for the email addresses of every single person on each of those panels, and I sent carefully crafted, rhetorically invitational, gratitude-laden, <laughs> and I hoped persuasive requests <coughs> for people to bring extra copies of their scripts that I could read from for their talk. <coughs> the time and organization this work involved meant I could not do it for every conference. And even when I did do it, I could never predict whether those I contacted would be willing to provide a script, remember to bring one, or even respond to my email. I can't tell you the number of times people have apologetically said to me, I'll send you my paper afterwards. For these reasons, I was drawn to disability studies panels because the panelists frequently built accessibility into their talk. I learned to make predictions about which panels would be most likely to have speakers share access copies, and I planned my session attendance accordingly. Those access copies meant that even if I did not laboriously contact everyone ahead of time, and even if the interpreting was subpar, I would still be able to engage in some capacity in real time with the panelists and the audience at the conference. In this way, because of the mattering of how I process sound and visual input, I was repeatedly connected to disability studies scholarship and other disabled scholars, even though I did not, at that time, understand their work as relevant to my own. My efforts in collaboration and coalition with many others to navigate and build accessible spaces at conferences, as well as my experiences of smoother paths of access to disability studies had a direct consequence on the kind of work I did, on the way that my thinking germinated and grew, and on my very presence and persistence in academia. One of the key points that I will stress throughout this talk is that thinking about accommodation and access procedures is a means of enabling presence and participation for disabled faculty. When those procedures are not in place, when the responsibility for access falls largely on the disabled person to create their own paths, then disabled faculty are not fully present and they are not able to fully participate and engage in the way that faculty are generally expected to. My concerns about access throughout this talk are not only about disability access, of course. There's a long and extensive history of scholarship focusing on the many ways that higher education is built on an exclusionary system aimed at protecting access for highly privileged groups while preventing access for many others. As disability scholar Jay Dormage, D-O-L-M-A-G-E, had written in his book, Academic Ableism, which is available free and open access. Disability, this is the quote, disability has always been constructed as the inverse or opposite of higher education. Or let me put it differently, higher education has needed to create a series of versions of lower education to justify its work and ground its exceptionalism, end quote. This exceptionalism is not only ableist, but it's racist, it's sexist, it's eugenicist, it's classist. 
Relics of exceptionalism are everywhere at U of M. From frequent reminders about the size of the endowment to publicly touted ratings and rankings that show yeah. various schools and programs and units as the number one this or the number two that. At the same time, U of M is also replete with attention to access in lots of ways. I've been really impressed by the work happening at NCIB around supporting scholars of color and especially the LSNA College Collegiate Fellows Program, which offers various kinds of support for underrepresented scholars moving into tenure track lines here at U of M. The kinds of things that enable people's persistence in higher education include time and energy, accommodation, language diversity, cultural competence, financial resources, affirmation and recognition of cultural and social identity, housing and food stability, among others. So while there are lots of ways that I think U of M is really working to address systemic injustice in academia and create space for faculty who don't fit the typical mold or who aren't already what disability scholar Tanya Tiskowski might call expected types. When a disability is concerned, I gotta tell you, the situation is dire. And it can be fairly accurately characterized with a term that I'm developing called disattention. Disattention is an intentionally awkward and clunky polyvalent neologism that I've coined to point to multiple ways that disability is attended in everyday movements in the world. Frequently, disattention involved singling disability out as a special or exceptional circumstance while ignoring it as an everyday occurrence. In separating the prefix dis from attention with a hyphen as well as giving it that italics, I want to emphasize that compartmentalization of disability to special places, beings, and or times while also playing on the meaning of the prefix dis as removal, aversion, negation, or reversal of action. The imperceptibility of disability has been remarked by numerous disability studies scholars who acknowledge the everydayness of disability while crit critiquing its frequent elision by those who are not already focused on disability. But this attention, much like disability itself, resists containment and insists on escaping boundaries placed around it. It is, of course, about disabling attention and disabled attentional practices, a way of invoking the kinds of attention performed and enacted by disabled people and that emerge out of disabled experiences. So, Disability is frequently only recognized under very specific circumstances, such as those that we might colloquially refer to as special. It's something we might study or research, but it is not something that we always identify with ourselves. It's out there, needing help and resources, but rarely right here in front of us. I've been complicit in this erasure of disability myself, while I have a disability that is fairly easily perceptible, one that necessitates different ways of moving and behaving and being, it's more often the case that people act like nothing needs to change. And nothing, my disability doesn't matter than that they act like they have any understanding of how things might need to be different. Um, so when I began on the tenure track, I believed that I needed to make sure that my disability was never a problem for anyone else. I didn't want others in my department or at my university to think that having an interpreter or having real-time captioning at an event was annoying. I didn't want people to think I was annoying. And I did not want to be excluded from events and activities happening on campus. In particular, I worried about people being frustrated by how much work accommodations involved. And I undertook what I might now characterize as Herculean efforts to make sure that none of the folks who might be voting on my tenure case were ever frustrated. I thought of this in terms of my efforts to smooth others' encounters with sign language interpreting 
especially because as a researcher who studies interaction, I know how quickly people can become frustrated or uncomfortable with less familiar interactional styles and practices. I heard versions of this perspective over and over again in the dis disabled faculty interviews that I conducted. People repeatedly mentioned ways that they work to make their disability unavailable for others to notice, as unobtrusive and unapparent and un un unproblematic as possible. Sometimes they did this because their disability was not already readily apparent. And there are very real fears about how people with minimal understanding of disability might respond or make sense of faculty members' work if they linked it with a disability identification. Take Nicola, for instance. As a contingent faculty member in the humanities who was actively job seeking in academia at the time of our interview, she was exceptionally guarded and careful about revealing her disability to others in any way. She had multiple sclerosis, which is progressive and incurable, but whose progress can be slowed under very particular conditions that she worked exceptionally hard to maintain. These efforts ensured that she could be fully present at work in ways that would reveal nothing of her health condition. She worried that if anyone knew she had a life-threatening chronic condition, she would be all but unhirable and having academic employment meant having health insurance that would sustain her life. After describing a particular legion she had, she went on to tell the following story about what she does on the first day of class. This, and I'm gonna read uh, a narrative uh, from her interview. One of the hardest things is, in short-term memory, um, it takes me a long time to learn my students' names. And that kind of upsets me because I take, I've always taken pride in the fact that I care about my students. Like it's something that's in my statement of teaching philosophy is that one of the things that I do is that I make an effort to connect with them, connect with my students and help them understand that I truly care about them, that I'm really committed to their success. And this is part of my pedagogy, that I connect with my students as human beings. Um, so, at the beginning of the semester, uh, I usually just tell them, you know, listen, I'm getting old. And they love that because they always think, I mean, you know, I look young. I'm young and I look younger than I am. So listen, guys, I'm getting, listen, I'm getting old. So I need you to bear with me because it's going to take me a few weeks to learn your name. But I want you to know that this is not because I don't care about you. I very much want to learn your name. It's just that, you know, you start getting old this is what happens. I'm like, so I want you to hold me to it, and if I don't get your name by the fourth or fifth week, you can fail me. They love this, and I like, I spend a lot of time like trying to memorize their names. If I can get it into long-term memory, I'm good. But until I get it back into long-term, it's an issue, and I always feel bad. In this story, while Nicola makes her disability available to the interviewer, she clearly works to mask it in front of her students. And what's so interesting about this story to me is the way she marshaled other identity and cultural resources to deflect attention to disability. She knows that her students won't notice that she isn't learning their names. But she doesn't want to tell them that she has issues with her brain preventing her from doing so. Instead, she uses humor and cultural discourses around aging to point away from disability. I'm getting old, she told them. But as a white woman who looks young, as she put that, I'm young and I look even younger than I am. Her claim about aging is clearly read as a joke by her students. But the ease with which the joke is received and with which it enabled her to offset negative judgments students might make of her for not learning their name quickly that's how disattention works. Dominant forms of disattention are shaped by systems of ableism that teach us to devalue disability and consequently to ignore it. We are not looking for disability, so we don't notice it even when it is right there. Now I want to be clear 
say I'm not suggesting that we start scrutinizing our colleagues to see if there might be some disability there <laughs> somewhere that we're not paying attention to. That's not my point. I'm also not saying that Nicola should feel completely free or nor that she should be compelled to be upfront about her disability to her students or her colleagues. My point is about the way that what we do perceive offsets, refuses, elides, hides, invisibilizes, or otherwise erases the possibility of disability. Let me share another story of disattention. This one shared by Tonya, a black woman working as a research scientist at an elite university. She had a chronic lung disease that ultimately necessitated a double lung transplant. During her interview, she shared a story that is an exemplar of disattention, and it points to just how hard it is to make disability available for others to notice. To put that another way, disattention is not just about lack of awareness or casual inattention. It is a refusal, a willful refusal and avoidance of disability, of keeping disability at a distance. So here's Tonya. I didn't need oxygen after the transplant. I went back to work. And what I've learned is that everyone just thinks that I got a transplant and everything is fine. And so people, you know, people would say things like, how are you doing? Uh, how are you feeling? And they'll definitely ask me those sort of things. How's it going? But no one's ever really like come back and just said, no, I, I, I guess I don't feel that anyone's really asking about my disability. Just they're sort of asking about my general health, knowing that it's been a transplant and that things have been tough. But um, just like that was when, like when I said that, my boss said, I don't consider you to be disabled. That was actually two weeks before I went out on leave and a week before I started using oxygen again. And I was just like, I'm just sitting here in your office out of breath because I walked here trying to make our meeting time, and you don't consider me disabled. And I was like, well, the ADA considers me disabled. Like, uh, so I guess I'm just like, I don't think people see me as having a disability right now. Tonya's case offers such a pointed, devastating example. But I want to stress that it's not exceptional. This is how it always is. Disabled faculty in these interviews repeatedly underscored how hard it was to get people around them to recognize disability, no matter what physical or material evidence was directly in front of them. Perception of disability was complicated by Tonya's status and the institutional hierarchies in her workplace. As one might expect at an elite institution, faculty were incredibly high-powered, exceptionally productive, and stars at the top of their field. There wasn't really room for disability in their bodies and minds, a point further underscored by another interviewee, Priya, who, a faculty member of color who left an elite institution to take a job at a state university. She made the shift in part because of her experience of trying to balance um, and in a compulsion and preference for non-disclosure and the work that it took for her to be present at work while addressing privately and personally a health condition that led to debilitating chronic pain and required multiple invasive surgeries. Colleagues advised her to not say anything about her health issues because she was doing so well and there was no need for anyone to know but when her record would speak for itself. But creating that record took everything she had, every single moment of her personal life, work that was entirely imperceptible to her colleagues. There are real costs to not having support, not having access, not being one full self at work, and spending significant portions of your non-work hours maintaining your health enough to be able to work. 
when people around you have no idea that your situation is different from theirs and cannot imagine or understand your experience, they evaluate your work, your productivity, and your behaviors against a normative standard, the one that they already find familiar. I mentioned earlier that for years, I worked hard to smooth my colleagues' access to sign language interpreting, to eliminate anything that might be frustrating, annoying, or problematic. This meant that I alone made interpreting requests. Yet over time, a number of cracks in the system began to appear, as when my colleagues would make decisions that would undercut the work I'd done to ensure my access to a meeting, an event, or an occasion. For instance, because of the advanced planning required to secure interpreting, I need meetings to be scheduled at least several weeks in advance. It doesn't work well for me to have my department chair announce impromptu faculty meetings on an inconsistent schedule, and it helps tremendously for all of these meetings to be scheduled before the hecticness of the semester starts so that I can put in the request before things get really busy. Of course, there's always occasions when things get canceled and have to be rescheduled, but when people had no idea how much time and energy scheduling these meetings was for me, they would think nothing of sending a meeting, an email saying, I'm sick today, let's just meet next week, same time. This often meant that I couldn't go, or it meant that I spent several hours I didn't have in my already busy schedule filling out an online form waiting to hear back from disability services if anyone, much less my preferred providers, was available and responding to multiple emails about whether captioning, remote captioning, such and such interpreter that I've never worked with, but who was available, would be acceptable. It also meant that I spent a lot of time making arrangements for a meeting that didn't happen. For just about every meeting I go to, I get email requests from disability services or from interpreters asking about materials that they can use to prep, uh, which also means that I have to communicate with event organizers, speakers, folks who create agendas, and more, and trying to make sure I remember to get that information back to the interpreters. You might imagine that I drop some of these balls, simply because of the sheer volume of them. I have forgotten entirely to request accommodations for conferences until I've been en route on the plane. Um, so the work that I put into ensuring that I have accommodations is an entire layer of my academic life that few of my colleagues know about or understand, and which does not factor into anyone's evaluations of my work and my productivity, except possibly negatively when they may think I am disorganized or condescendingly tell me that I need to make my interpreting request sooner. Rhetorical scholar Annika Conrad has theorized this kind of work in terms of what she called access labor that disabled people undertake in order to be able to be present in a space. Over time, my access labor has shifted. I no longer take on all of the work of creating access but try to make very transparent the kind of access work that I do and make that work visible for others. I've also begun to make efforts to distribute the work so that it doesn't fall entirely on my shoulders. In this vein, I've started CCing meeting organizers on my interpreting request so that they can see that an interpreter is being requested. And I include their information as the contact for the prep materials. I've become more proactive about committees I'm on. Before the start of the semester, I'll contact the chair of the committee and ask that we put all the meetings for the entire semester on the calendar now, as much as, as possible. I send a warm and invitational email to my department listserv, asking folks who are arranging events and whose publicity materials may not yet be finalized to just share with me when those events are and maybe what speakers they're bringing to campus so that I can think about whether I want to go um, rather than continuously and repeatedly being surprised to learn that such and such wonderful event is happening tomorrow or next week 
with little room for me to build in plans to request interpreting. Now, this did not happen overnight. It has involved laboriously building relationships one at a time with colleagues in my department, in units, and programs that I am affiliated with, where I regularly want to be present. I have figured out who is likely to actually care, who is likely to dismiss or ignore my needs, and I've been tremendously grateful for the hard work of many, many academic staff members who understand the behind the scenes work it takes to pull off a successful in and inclusive event. <coughs> Let me take a drink. This has happened too because I've been at my current university for 12 years and I have built ongoing relationships and friendships with people on campus who care that I am able to be present and that I am part of what is happening. However, if my 12 years at Delaware have given me some relative stability and the opportunity to build relationships that make disability available for perception, my experience taking a one-year scholar in residence position at the U of M has laid particularly bare the challenges of disattention. I'm overwhelmed with disattention on this campus. It's everywhere, disability is everywhere and yet it's nowhere. Of all the forms of disattention that I've observed in my time here, perhaps most significant is the disattention to faculty accommodation. After being offered this scholar in residence opportunity, I asked after accommodation processes. I was surprised, to say the least, to learn that there is no formal process for faculty accommodation at the University of Michigan. This slide showed the screenshot from the LSNA website on employee accommodation. The part that I'm showing here appeared after a legal description of what the ADA is, and then an extremely brief bulleted list of some possible reasonable accommodation. It said in bold, and so what I have on this slide said in bold, what if an employee needs an accommodation? The answer? The employee should contact their supervisor if the need for an accommodation arises. Some accommodations are easily handled within the department. Depending on the situation, medical documentation and or assistance through work connections may be included. The next question. What if an employee has questions about the ADA and about possible accommodation? And the response is, the employee can reach out to the designated LSNA HR representative or find out more information from the following resources. And the resources listed are the ADA coordinator within the Office for Institutional Equity. No name, just a bunch of contact information. And then the faculty and staff assistance program, which is an outside counseling service, I believe, where you can have a limited number of calls or such. So, in other words, the official employee accommodation policy at the University of Michigan, 30 years after the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, is that a disabled employee should negotiate any accommodations they need with their supervisor. For a faculty member, this means going to your department chair. For me, this meant going to the director of the center hosting my scholar and resident. If accommodations are denied or inadequate, an employee can start an interactive process involving the ADA coordinator. This is a single person, one person, who is responsible for ADA compliance at not only U of M here in Ann Arbor, but Michigan Medicine, U of M Flint, and U of M Dearborn. And they'll meet with the supervisor, they'll meet with the disabled faculty member, and they'll discuss, you know, and make a recommendation of what is legally required under the ADA, and maybe suggest some additional things that you could do that might be good ideas. While NCRD has been unfailingly kind, absolutely willing to do what is needed to ensure that I can request sign language interpreting or cut transcription for events that I want to attend, there's an entire institutional practice and history of disattention that sets any disabled faculty member seeking to enact change up 
for failure. There is no sign language interpreting infrastructure. Qualified interpreters have been exceptionally difficult to secure because interpreter coordinators within SSD are only for registered students who have disabilities. So not even all students with disabilities, just the ones who register. And Michigan Medicine has an interpreter coordinator and a team of staff interpreters, but there's nothing here on this Ann Arbor campus. So if somebody from the members of the public, employees, faculty want to attend an event and have interpreting, the policy puts the onus on UNIS and event organizers across campus to provide and put into place access arrangements. But almost none of these people have any experience or knowledge of the nuances and complexity of interpreting, type, and communication access needs that deaf faculty might have. It's absolutely unreasonable to expect every single faculty member or department admin staff person to have this depth of knowledge and effectively secure appropriate accommodations for any situation. This is my 15th year as a faculty member. In the 14 years prior to this, I have had centralized institutional support for my accommodation needs at two different institutions. This centralized accommodation has not always made securing access seamless or even straightforward. But that access to centralized accommodations has enabled me to build relationships with colleagues and to now know me well enough to be able to ask after whether I'm following a conversation or whether they need to make adjustments in the physical arrangement of a room. If I had not, and I'm going off script here, if I had not had this centralized accommodation, I would never have been in the room. I wouldn't have built those relationships at all. That I am not a permanent employee at U of M is the only thing that makes the tenuousness of my accommodation experience bearable and not a source of extraordinary stress. I'm a tenured faculty member on sabbatical leave. If I don't receive accommodation for an event or a meeting, I can shrug and say, well, that's more time to focus on writing my book and go on about my day. The stakes would feel exceptionally higher, exponentially higher, if I was not tenured, if I was not white, given the whiteness of many, many of U of M's institutional spaces, and if I was trying to build a professional career on this campus. Because I plan to leave at the end of this academic year, I'm not investing in the same kind of relationship building that I would in a situation of permanent employment. But also, because I do not have predictable or reliable access to sign language interpreting or cut transcription, which is a structural reality shaped by myriad, deeply rooted, embedded disattention that infuse every space, environment, and interaction on this campus. The conditions for building these relationships, the resonances that can try to amplify, the associations that can try to mobilize and adhere are materially different. My individual experience is overwhelmed by waves of disattention that limit possibility and will shape me as I move through this space. So I want to move now to make some concrete suggestions, concrete-ish, that you can build on, work on right now to make campus a more hospitable place, an institution where disabled faculty can be present and thrive. My first recommendation is to prioritize human relationships over legal ability. I have story after story of absolutely absurd suggestions that have been made or concerns that have been read. And what I, I can only assume is total seriousness. I've already pointed to the accommodation process, which involves negotiating with your supervisor. This supervisor is almost always someone who is directly responsible for evaluating your work. And I've already pointed out how evaluations of disabled faculty are almost always cast against a normative background that assumes similarity of experience and little depth of understanding. Such a situation is untenable for disabled faculty on the tenure track concerned about their long-term employment. Two, department chairs rotate in and out of these roles. Some people will get it, and others will not. 
the work that goes into building this understanding is intense, incredibly emotional, exceptionally difficult, and a long-term project. To get one person to a place of understanding is a huge achievement. To have to start that process over again every three to five years is Sisyphean. Another absurdity involves the challenges around securing what are sometimes called access copies or scripts of remarks. Some of you, and many of you in this room have one that I made available today. I work in a field that tends to script remarks. So making these available involves simply printing off some extra copies. It does involve some advanced planning, but my entire faculty life revolved around advanced planning. I used to find this need for advanced planning annoying, but I've learned to incorporate it into my workflow. Having access copies at events is a lifesaver for me. It would have made my experience exponentially better this year if it was a common practice on this campus, given the difficulty of finding sign language interpreting. I could have tried to go to events and follow along with the access copy, even if there was no interpreter. When a faculty member makes requests for access copies on this campus, however, they are met with a range of responses. They include things like, eh, no, that could be awkward, or the speaker doesn't want to share their remarks. There's little response to the faculty member that things could be done differently. The faculty member just gets a no with a mention that it's awkward or uncomfortable or difficult. At the bonus, the faculty member is often asked to explain how access copies should work or to create a policy or a plan or a process for incorporating access copies for the unit or the program or the department. Now, when no access scripts are provided, it's tantamount to denying an accommodation request. And of course, there's lots of complexities involved. Not everyone reads from a script. Often a speaker may be working up until the last minute, revising things. Some events are more informal, and speakers may just be presenting extemporaneously. But none of these things prevent us from proactively building in practices that can su support written textual access to what is being spoken. And we should recognize those things, and, but balance them against accommodation needs and accessibility practices that enable more people to be involved and present and included in the everyday life of the university. And honestly, part of what is so frustrating about this entire thing is that the institutional response to all of the challenges around faculty and accommodation is that turn to absurdity, rather than a genuine interest in seeing how we can change things, do things differently, and figure out a way to be inclusive. For example, when experiencing a denial of accommodation, such as by having a request for access copies turned down, you can launch that interactive process whereby the ADA coordinator, the same one who singly oversees three U of M campuses and Michigan Medicine, will meet with the faculty member and whoever denied the access copy and then make a report indicating the legal obligation for accommodation provision according to the ADA for every single talk. This procedure is absurd. But there's no alternative. There's no suggested alternative. This is just what's in front of you. Well, if you want to start the interactive process, so what I am observing over and over again is that without a clear centralized resource for knowledge, support, information, advocacy, resource-based and evidence-based practices, people are really, really, really resistant to changing the way they do things for one person. There is, in general, greater acceptance of one-time purchases that are sometimes seen as fixing an issue, purchasing a specialized software program or technology, or buying a motorized scooter or a mobility device, an assistive listening device, a screen reader. And there's less willingness to reconsider, to think that maybe, just maybe, the way we've been doing things isn't the way things have to be done. Human interactions are hard. Ongoing accommodations are hard. Changing institutional environments with long histories 
and share it, quote unquote, tradition is really, really hard. People can't do it by themselves, and if they want faculty will quietly, and not so quietly, disappear, burn out, or worse, if they continue to be confronted with this onslaught of ignorance, indifference, and outright condescension when they try to work out what it is that they need. So I will conclude once again with a call for a centralized space and funding mechanism for faculty and staff accommodation. At a university with a $12.4 billion endowment and which boasted $500 million in returns on that endowment last fall, this can be done. Some things are in place, and I do want to acknowledge that there are individuals on this campus putting effort into putting things in motion, but without a structure in place without somewhere for information to come from, without a centralized space with some authority and, res and resources to support faculty accommodation requests repeatedly over and over again, I'm confronted with people on this campus making a choice in favor of absurdity over human inclusion and acknowledgement of disability. Be better, Michigan. As a final comment, I'll make the caveat that in some ways, Michigan is not that unlike many other institutions. Faculty accommodation is hard. It's not anything that anyone has solved. But it is something that we can work on, work towards, and improve. Thank you. If anybody has any questions for Stephanie, I'm happy to bring the microphone over. Hi. Um, I was wondering what you thought a place for staff to to uh, begin having these conversations in our departments and help our faculty and our students as well in having more access. Yeah, um, that's a good question, right? And I don't know. I'm I'm guessing you're from psychology. Okay, um, so I don't know the culture of most departments on this campus, um, so I'm not gonna really give you like a do this thing, but I will say that having people who get it is incredibly sustaining, right? So having a space where you can talk to someone who doesn't say, oh, everybody is saying this is that, or I understand when they clearly don't, right? Um, I have built most of these kinds of spaces within my professional field of people who do disability studies work. Um, I also have a, a Facebook group for deaf academics that I uh, coordinate and that's a space where we engage around them. But I think institutionally, it's a little more complicated because of time and energy and without practical um, results, let me say. And I'll give you a quick example. There's an organization or group on this campus already called the Council for Disability Concerns, if I'm getting that name correct. And it's, it's great, right? Like, I'm on the listserv and I've gone to like, one or two of their meetings and the people in these group in this group are, you know, invested and interested, and they put on some fantastic events. Um, but there's such a range of disability experiences among the folks in that group, right? So somebody will say, "Hey, I'm having such and such challenge," and people try to kind of problem solve around that. But you know, I don't know anything about that particular issue. Well, I only know about it because I'm listening to different people's stories. I don't have resources that I can share. None of us have any real power or clout, so we're just kind of bouncing emails back and forth. I mean, it's not bad. Just, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that this space is there. Um, but it's, but it's, um, it's complicated to think about how a department would organize around 
a, a loose conglomeration of people who want to talk about disability, right? Like you want to be thinking about what the outcome of it is, is the desire for social connection, is the desire for allies, is the desire for resources, is the desire for changing a policy or a procedure. When there's a goal, when there's some kind of clear purpose beyond gathering, then it's easier to sustain. Um, but I think it's really valuable to create spaces, right? To just sort of have informal events, to, to think about what kinds of things people want and need. Um, I also think, as a related, um, I think, and this is not the question that you asked, but I want to mention it. One of the things about disability is that people think disability is bad. Right, so we shouldn't talk about it. It's kind of like, you know, you don't want to comment on someone's weight. So that's just like, we're just gonna pretend that we don't know this, right? But when disability becomes just a part of conversation, and I'm not talking about identifying people's individual disabilities. I'm talking about just acknowledging that, you know, there might be disabled people in this room, so I have access copies. I'm not assuming any of you are disabled, but I'm saying disability is something that I'm thinking about then you create a space where people can talk about disability, whether or not they're identifying as disabled. Right now, you have mostly spaces where the only people who want to talk about disability are having to say, I'm personally disabled and I have these things going on, and right, but if we're just talk, if disability become part of that conversation, so I'm not answering your question, but I'm thinking about dimensions that kind of respond to it. I don't think. I wonder if the focus on universal design may be something for the future. And the way that I'm thinking about it is like, when we started out with sidewalks and we had little ramps for wheelchairs and scooters, then parents with children, with uh, strollers, they could easily get up. Movers can easily move their stuff and it has multi-benefits. Like in this case, for me personally, it has been great benefit to have this. I have also hearing loss with hearing aids and a lot of my generation has hearing aids. But the problem is for me, it's harder for me to understand your response. If it was a card system for me, it would have been even better because it would be more accessible for me. But um, I just, you haven't mentioned universal designs. Is that something you think for the future is going to be helpful? But it takes time. Social change takes time. Thank you for your great presentation. Um, yes, and I, I think universal design is fantastic, right? It's a, um, and I would say that the regular practice of making access copies available is one type of universal design moves that you can just incorporate. Um, one of the ways that I think about universal design is as what can we do that will be more accessible um, in general? And, and I say that in general because universal design is not universal. Um, and so individuals will always have, you know, maybe distinct needs or unique needs that don't fit whatever the configuration of a room is. So you don't want to rely on a one side fits all, oh, we followed the universal design list that's in front of me, and so this room is now universally accessible. That's not true, right? And there's all kinds of ways that disability intersects with other kinds of access that I mentioned at the start of the talk. Um, so thinking about trigger warning, thinking about other kinds of things that you can't expect. You don't know who is going to come into a space and you don't know exactly how their bodies and minds are going to work. So you need to have a space where people can ask for access or changes or accommodation because you're not going to be able to predict all of that. Another example is I've sometimes had people say to me, we should just have sign language interpreters at every event. 
I don't think that's reasonable, right? Because sign language interpreters are expensive. Um, I don't think that the answer is having sign language interpreters in rooms where there are no deaf people. Um, there's enough challenges getting sign language interpreters in rooms where there are deaf people. Like I'm not interested in saying that they should be everywhere. Um, but I think your suggestion about universal design is brilliant, right? And I think that that's absolutely something that event organizers and teachers and people who run faculty meetings and people who put on events can try to build in. So thank you for that. Thank you very much for your talk. I think it's really going to make a difference here. Um, you mentioned the Council for Disability Concerns. Uh, I have been coordinating that for the past 17 years, and believe me, we have tried so hard to get a centralized space and funding mechanism in this very decentralized university. We had a council meeting this very day at noon, and we were talking about little bits of progress that we had made through the years. I think that your being here is a significant symbol of some of the progress that we have made and we're going to continue to make. Uh, we kept the council going. It's like we kept a little flame going. But as we said at our meeting today, the people who have disabilities and their allies are making the big changes. And I'm really happy. And I thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done to keep that group together. Thank you, Professor, for your, um, your remarks today. They were really enlightening and also did, I think, a great job of um, highlighting all the different aspects of disability in these spaces uh, from different levels of the hierarchy in academia. Um, as someone who's been here at this university in one form or another as a student, as a graduate student, as um, a staff member for close to 20 years, um, that's really crazy to think about. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that people do stay here a long time. People build a lot of institutional capital, a lot of relationships amongst their own department or people in their spheres. Um, but because of that, we can be myopic about potential better ways to do things. Have you seen institutions, in other higher education institutions that have deployed this kind of centralized funding mechanism? Is there a model that we can use to um, to put pressure around for the University of Michigan to, uh, to kind of adopt rather than trying to come up with, a with um, to work entirely from scratch, but having something to respond to with the specific needs of our decentralized, uh, lovely Ann Arbor. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm hesitant to say that there's a single model because I think every institution is different. I will say Ohio State Disability Services Office is one of the best. Um, it's nationally recognized. It's one of the reasons that I got accommodations when I went to college at all, right? Because there was an office, because there was a structure, I actually got accommodations when I went to college. With, because other places without offices would have let me just go, right? And not try and, and just kind of realize, right, and get by by reading the book, but not really by following discussion. Um, so I, I think there are natural models, but I think that um, U of M is its own distinct thing, right, <laughs> and that's why, I mean, I, 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 I think every institution is, is unique in its own way. And so um, Ohio State's a great model. Look there. That's my recommendation. Uh, first, like everyone else, thank you for a, a wonderful talk. I love it when I go to a talk. hour. Um, I'm a professor at the School of Public Health, which is notoriously old and um, very unaccommodating, as, as I learned from my students. We're moving into the sphere of online teaching, which I am not sure about, but one of the 
pros that people continue to throw out is how wonderful it is to reach those inaccessible students and how it's actually helping with diversity and disability for folks who maybe can't come into a space or can't sit in an auditorium. I find that argument a little bit tenuous and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this online teaching and what it's, it's this idea of disattention um, and how that plays in there. Thanks. Um, I think online teaching can be a tremendous inclusive strategy for reaching groups of students who wouldn't have trouble physically accessing campus. I don't think online teaching is inherently more accessible than other kinds of teaching, and I think it presents different kinds of challenges. Um, some of you may know that UC Berkeley uh, was sued because of needing to make uh, MOOCs. They had a number of m massively open online courses, and someone, deaf people who wanted to take these classes um, said, hey, you should caption them. And Berkeley said, nah, that's too expensive. And so the deaf people sued. The deaf people won, and Berkeley responded by saying, no more MOOCs. We're just going to take them all down. Um, so that was, that was you know, kind of eye-opening. Um, because one of the things about online stuff, right, is that it's a lot of video. And for me, I need those to be captioned. And capturing video is time and work. And at universities where disability services offices are really not well funded, um, the disability services office is not always able to do that, so it gets put onto the faculty member. And you can say, oh, well, you know, just use only captioned videos. But this kind of came up with a, a colleague of mine at the University of Delaware who had a deaf student enrolled in an English, I mean, a, a early childhood education class that she was teaching. And she had all these videos, the like clips of classrooms, right, where teachers are interacting with students. And none of them are captured. I mean, they're like, you know, clips from like a research project video. And, it's, and the disability services office told her that she was going to have to caption all of these. And it was a fundamental core aspect of her class that students were going to be engaging with and seeing the concepts that they were learning about in the book enacted by teachers and students in the classroom. So, um, so I think that there are definitely ways of realizing um, accessibility through online education. I am hesitant to sort of hold it up as this is the solution because no matter where you go, you have to think about this. You have to ask, who can't access this? What bodies of mind are easily able to move and navigate and use, and what bodies and minds are left out or excluded? Um, and so it solves some problems. It opens up bodies, is my answer. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for your talk. Um, I guess I have a question about language and the kind of language that we've seen around disability and accommodations at this university, which tends to default to an us versus them language, even if it, and maybe especially when it's cast in kind of a savior model or a helping model. And so I've been reflecting a lot on how we can shift, talking about shifting, shift our language to have more inclusive language so we all are us and we all are working together towards accommodations and appropriately recognizing things but also not calling them out if it's not appropriate. So I guess I, that's, it's kind of a vague question, but I, do you have any thoughts on language? I mean, just the sh screenshot that you showed us from the ADA, it's full. There's so many things you could unpack there about problematic language. But if you have any, because that seems essential to changing our culture on disability, if you have any thoughts or examples on 
language shifts that we might be engaging in and how those are connected to the conceptual kind of transformation we need around disability, I'd be very gratified to hear your insights. Uh, thank you for that question. I think that's really important. And I think that that is actually another uh, sort of practice that people can engage uh, that doesn't cost any money and doesn't, you know, um, require a new centralized bureaucracy, although I still think that there should be one. Um, but um, to, to, just give, to come back to the kind of framing that I did at the start of my talk, like I acknowledge that there were people who might not be able to see me well, so I described myself. I brought in these access copy framing, right? I, I openly ask questions about whether this is working. And I make it okay to say it's not working. And to kind of say, can we try a different way of doing this? Um, so I think some of that uh, framing, and that's not a specific term, it's not a specific language concept, right? Uh, but The, the us versus them thing is a real issue, right? As long as people think disability is only something that, you know, people with problems have, or disability is something that should be talked about openly, that most faculty are living seamless, amazing, unproblematic lives. Ha <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, so, but yeah, I, I think the us versus them distinction that you brought up is a great place to start. Um, and you don't have to identify the disabled to kind of make this something that you acknowledge and talk about. Melissa. Um, Mine is not a, a question, it's more of a comment to us who work for university. Hi, Anna. <laughs> um, I think of what we've had as this initiative in the last few years about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. And I don't know where that line item on diversity being part of inclusion of disabilities as the conversation at the table. I, I, that's to me a really difficult thing. I work in the School of Social Work and I am the diversity designated person, and a lot of my work is with students. I don't see a lot of stuff with staff or faculty, and I'd have to go revisit our DEI plan, but I'm just thinking of the conversation. We, being able to catapult it from hindsight or, oh, okay, we need to have that. When we're talking about $5 million that is like sitting out there, I mean, I think of our Office of, uh, of uh, Services with Students with Disabilities where they're at capacity. I think of, you know, technology in the Knott Center has a whole place, but it's always like it's hiding or you're, you're kind of scared because of the stigma. I'm a learning disabled person, and I know that I pay for an adaptive, I pay for myself an adaptive aid to be able to help me with things on the computer because things scramble for me. I haven't actually taken the initiative to say, will they pay for it? But it's always these things about no money, can't do it, blah, 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 or certain issues. And I know that in the school, we talk a lot about our DEI excluding our staff and faculty and really more on the students. So I think that's the shift to me that we need to bring up. We keep saying DEI, DEI, DEI. Well, DEI dis includes disabilities and we all need to do better. We all need to do better. It shouldn't be a second conversation. It should be part of the whole conversation. And that's something that I'm, I'm constantly thinking about on the basis that I was just think, talking to this young woman here. Um, and when we think of aging, it's an aging society. I'm getting older. So we think about the things that come with our limited sight, low sight, you know, other things that go on with our hearing, whatever else. Well, the universal design uh, helps everyone. And I know I've had that conversation within the school. I've had events. Um, I've had, I've been a little absent from the council. But 
it's that piece of being able to take that level of conversation almost like you're, you know, yelling. You know, we can say all these things about race, and, and I'm not saying that we have fixed or cured things, but we, it's, where is it at the table? So I'm just saying this to us as employees, staff, students, or whoever in this space that have been here. I've been here, as this gentleman said, nearly 15 plus years um, in, in capacity of a student, and doing my graduate degree, and then working in the School of Social Work for 12 years as of this last week. So I just know that we can't let someone else do the job. It's really where we have our voice, just like students have a voice and say they're unhappy about one thing or another. But I think we do not, as staff and faculty, I'm not excluding students, but that's the piece that don't. If we got this kind of money sitting somewhere that's going somewhere else, why can't it be given to, you know, or divided or find some central, you know, because I find how I'm trying to find students get computers, you know, or get AIDS or get curve rows, you know, whatever it is that, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, things to adapt to be able to pay for the things that they need. But I think also stigma is huge. Do we say it if it's an invisible disease, uh, you know, um, um, disability? It's easier to, you know, look at someone and say, oh, that's why they have that parking space. Oh, but what about the things, as you just said, that are, dis that, that are not seen and need that same attention? Yes, thank you. Comfortable with the pause, you know, so, you know, go back to the lecture days, pausing so that questions can emerge as people have them. Um, thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Please join me in, in once again thanking uh, Dr. Kirschbaum for uh, providing us with this discussion, talk and discussion. One of the things that I think is important to think about, um, went, I had the privilege of seeing the RSVP list for this event, and um, what I want to, to be noticed, um, and some of you are waving at each other out of recognition, some of you have never seen each other before, and part of that is because people are coming here from all over campus, um, in faculty, staff, student spaces, um, which is encouraging, you know, um, I mentioned all the different communities that Dr. Kirschbaum has been involved with or connected with since she's been here, that there's a growing awareness and recognition that this is an imperative that we need to engage and pay attention to. But it's also, you know, sobering because it suggests that we all have the same challenge and that we are recognizing that there are really not only individual but institutional level kind of barriers um, that um, and lack of opportunities that um, that we're all kind of experiencing in our different spaces because once we grow aware of it and all the ways that it matters in our lives um, that lack of structure becomes even more apparent and impactful um, and even frustrating so I'm hoping that one is that we we've have the names of people in this space and so as we are working on these issues um, within our center work and the and the um, and the allied communities that we're learning about and beginning to connect to that we can also begin to think about this particular group um, as interested actors in this space and we'll continue to share information with you about you know formal activities but also things that you share with us that we can share out as well to, to create another kind of network space of engagement and action from those of us who study these things from a scholarly perspective to those of us who are working on them in practice and policy or doing both um, uh, it's heartening to see this um, in, the con in the face of also, again, the sobering nature that this is a challenge that's pervasive um, and consistent across our, our very decentralized, my non-favorite word, uh, university space. Um, thank you for coming, and more to come on this topic and other um, related events um, 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 through our center and, again, through the broader U of M community. Thank you.